So our next speaker uh, needs no introduction. For me, he's simply my hero, uh, Dr. Jim Netterville from uh, Vanderbilt, uh, an outstanding uh, surgeon who has uh, defined uh, some of the standards very early on when we were talking about the anatomy and the approaches to the skull base. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Netterville. We've got 15 minutes to give a two-hour lecture. No, I was. <clears throat> the beauty of speaking last is I sat back there and adjusted my lecture to cut out all the overlap. I'm going to back up now and talk to the young doctors in the room, the ones that are aspiring skull-based surgeons, because I think each of the previous surgeons, let's see, nothing to disclose, have discussed well that this is not an either-or situation. We have all these different approaches, and sometimes I have one slide and it has a, the skull base approaches to the lateral skull base. There's 13 arrows and 13 names. I can't remember who did what. Uh, so I think that many times an approach is just so that one of us gets our name on something, and it's not very practical. So approaches in head and neck surgery really create narrow-minded thought. If I teach a resident on a head and neck case, this is the way you do it, you always follow these steps every time, work to my, my, my father, work for me, it'll work for you. You have just narrowly focused a resident and when something gets out of that field of view, he can't function, she can't function. So approaches, a surgery is far more than following steps and the real key to any approach in tumor resection is you have to have a keen understanding of the anatomy of your region, and each of our professors have demonstrated their keen understanding of the anatomy of the region. Then you have to understand an in-depth knowledge of the pathophysiology of the tumor. I tell the residents all the time, a one centimeter adenoid cystic in the infratemporal fossa, take out a small margin, radiate the microneural disease. A one centimeter recurrent, poorly differentiated tumor in the infratemporal fossa, you're gonna take out the whole post-radiation, you're gonna take out the whole infratemporal fossa, same size malignant tumor, same location, but you have to understand the in-depth knowledge. And finally, the question that I sit, surgery is the simplest thing we do. All of us can cut someone's head off, put it back on, it's not hard. Deciding when I'm gonna make that person's life better, and when am I gonna make their life worse? Is the cure worse than the disease? I want them to have quality of life. So in skull-based surgery, I see my friend Paul smiling back there. One of the huge issues all these years was, how do we leave people with quality? I've seen people come to other institutions and have big resections and sit in wheelchairs with strokes, drooling at 30 years old. Maybe the wrong decisions were made in doing their resection. So this is really key. What anatomy can I take out that will leave this person with quality of life and cure the disease? <clears throat> so back to the residents and young doctors. <clears throat> if we're coming into the central skull base, there's two holes, the foramen rotundum and the vidian canal. These guys are, I guess this is a laser pointer, this is a red dot as well, yes. These two fellows are a roadmap to the skull base. If I go through the foramen rotundum, it's five millimeters to the dura. If I go through this hole right here, it's two centimeters to the carotid. It's a very simple bit of anatomy, but when you really understand that anatomy, it opens up the entire skull base to the surgical procedures you've just been watching. And here we see this in an artist's rendering from the lateral approach. Here's the frame and rotundum, five millimeters to the dura. The beauty is the Gasserian ganglion is, ex is not extradural or intradural. It has dural on both sides of it. So you can resect out the whole Gasserian ganglion and you don't get CSF leak until you get right here. You can take out the V2, V3 for an adenoid cystic and save V1 as necessary. And here we are, angiofibromas, other tumors, two and a half centimeters, two centimeters to the carotid artery. So surgical access endoscopic has been a remarkable boon to decrease complications. But I'm gonna give you the in-between. Again, it's not, there's not surgical approaches, it's, how can I best get in, take out this tumor without hurting this patient? I'm gonna show you, through this approach, they lose a little bit of sensation of a couple of teeth, but I don't have to take out any intranasal structures. You've seen many approaches where most of the intranasal structures are taken out. 
and then an extension comes to the infratemporal fossa, an extension goes somewhere else. In smaller tumors, and I've, all, I've removed all the big tumors for you, we're gonna look at some small, simple tumors. If you do this transmaxillary approach, then you can not even touch the intranasal anatomy. No facial incision, excellent visualization, excellent for the midline, but the limit, this is the endoscopic approach, but the real limitations of the endoscopic approach are as all of our speakers have talked about is the infratemporal fossa and the destruction of the intranasal anatomy. So here is a small petrous apex granuloma. And this is, I'll show you this. Why, how would we make our judgment on this? This young man has had an ear approach for cholesterol granuloma. It's been resected twice. There's a piece of silastic sheeting right here. And now we have this lesion and he's getting headaches. This is a perfect endoscopic approach because we don't need to destroy this uh, anatomy in this region. And so I'm hoping uh, the videos play. It's always a great relief to a speaker when the videos play. So we see the cholesterol granulomas coming out of there. You just say a little prayer to heaven when the videos play. And in this young man, it doesn't want you have to advance to the next slide for me, friend. I told him at the end I was going to buy him coffee, the fellow that's running all this. And so now we're actually using frontal sinus instruments and a 70 degree scope to come all the way up in here and look, and here's the silastic sheeting. So this is a great endoscopic approach, not a transmaxillary approach, because I can see here, I don't even have to hurt endonasal anatomy to gain this. Um, in this situation, you can save all the turbinates working past the turbinates, and eventually we just reach in and pull out that silastic sheeting. Next slide. Yes, and here is another lesion <clears throat> where we have a low-grade chondrosarcoma, and we've missed most of them have talked about that, so I won't go into this, but I have a perfect endoscopic, but we don't need the transmaxillary approach. I'm just not, there we are. Now, if we look at the surgical access through this transmaxillary approach, we're gonna go on to a couple of examples. Here's the wife of the chairman of medicine. He's in the Institute of Medicine, and there was a lot of debates about what approach to do this, but we can all see this is a small schwannoma of V2, probably. But when we look at the CT scan, it's not of V2, it's of the Vidian region. So, transmaxillary, takes about 20 minutes to get in there, remove the posterior wall, dissect out the lesion. Now, I have a rule in skull-based surgery. If you get into the cavernous sinus, which many of these do, you have to tell jokes for five minutes with pressure, and you're golden. If you get into the carotid artery, you have to tell jokes for 10 minutes, and you're golden most of the time, because most of our holes are small holes. And so this young lady, we had a nice session of jokes for about five minutes with small amount of cavernous bleeding. She went home the next day. Again, here's a lesion through the transmaxillary approach. We, took, we didn't have to bother any intranasal structures. Nothing was removed. Binocular visualization, amputated it, and put a pulse, small sheet of alloderm there, and she was cured from this encephalocele. Here's a much larger lesion. This, you're not going to do endoscopically, so an intra, a transmaxillary approach. Now the, the beauty of these is for the cavernous sinus. Here's a young man with an angiofibroma. You can see in this situation, it's in the infratemporal fossa. And what's important to note here, this is where it's lost. I just redid another angiofibroma recently that was done endoscopically. The endoscopic approach is excellent in, in some of the most mature endoscopic hands in the world. But in many of us, Maybe it's, it's hard. See this right here? People leave this. There's the pterygoid plate. There's the angiofibroma that's invested all in the temporal, petri temporal apex in this region. And so we've got to gain quite laterally. And I saw another one recently, and the recurrences were here and here after an endoscopic approach because it just couldn't go laterally. This patient also has what we see for the residents in the room, the rotundum, the vidian. Angiofibromas grow up here. This is where they live. So an angiofibroma is like a piece of Play-Doh that's shoved against the skull base, and it goes into all the different openings. 
So they often go up into the cavern of sinus, and here is the extension into the orbital cavern of sinus. That's quite easy to remove through the transmaxillary approach. Here's the transmaxillary, here's the endoscopic approach just looking at the lesion. Now here is the transmaxillary approach. Can you stop the video at some second if I ask you to? Not right here. There's the tumor, the, just showing that we've gotten the inferior aspect of the tumor up. There's the greater palatine nerve. Now stop the video right there. Now you can see very well here, here's the inforbital nerve saved beautifully, the lateral pterygoid plate, the medial pterygoid plate, the orbital extension of the lesion. It's all 3D, two hands. In fact, my fellow has two hands in the wound and I have two hands in the wound, so teaching is phenomenal. Go ahead and play the rest of that video. So here is the origin of the tumor in the vidian canal and the rotundum is saved beautifully in this setting. Now most of the time, you can then deliver, let's see here, you can now deliver virtually all the tumor. The tumor is growing under the nasopharyngeal mucosa. So put an endoscope in to help yourself. I can deliver virtually all of it through the maxillary sinus. And then here's the small part right here going into the orbit by, not, by man, you know, both hands, by manual manipulation. I've already packed a little bit of fibular collagen into the cavernous sinus to slow down the bleeding in the cavernous sinus and the entire lesion can be removed. You'll see quite a number of these. There he is post-operatively. They go home the next day. Normal nasal anatomy. I haven't heard anything in his nose, so he won't have to come back for decrusting multiple times. And he won't be like my partner who had a small procedure where his middle turbinate was removed. And he, he still crust and still blows crust out 20 years after his procedure. So here's another lesion with the extension of the angiofibroma to the cavernous sinus. I just got, I'll just take, show a couple of more slides and we'll get out of here. Another resection transmaxillary of this lesion right here. Adenoid cystic going back into this region is excellent. Any tumor uh, that you can open up the maxillary sinus and you don't need to, you know, here we're going to remove a lot of the nasal structures of the nose anyway, so it doesn't matter which approach you use, but it's very helpful. Here is a young lady with a, see foramen ovale here, foramen ovale here. Her husband was a uh, manager of the Dodgers years ago. And so I was a joy to see this ring that covered half his hand from winning the, the World Series. I've never seen a ring like that in my life. And so here she is, transmaxillary approach. We're now gonna take off the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. That retractor for any of you Iowa grads is a remarkable thing, Paul. This is the McCabe antrum retractor. Dr. McCabe had his hand in everything. It looks like a metal fossa retractor, but it was made for this purpose by Brian McCabe, an otologist. We're going to remove the mucosa off the posterior wall, and now we're dissecting. This is the inforbital nerve. We're going to dissect, uh, fortunately for this schwannoma, we dissected off the lingual nerve, the inferalveolar nerve. They all came off. The tumor is removed. And here's the nerves, the inforbital nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve are still intact. Here's a young lady that most of the time I might do endoscopically, but again, these are people we wish we didn't have to operate on, but she's got a headache. And the neurologist and the family practice doctor and everyone's saying you've got to operate on her. Now she has a very narrow window between her carotid and the basilar dura and this. You could push over the basilar dura and get to it. You could push over the carotid. But years ago, I was just to show this, I went through a transmaxillary approach to get to this. And here we are going through the transmaxillary cross court. We're not bothering intranasal anatomy. We're going right into the sphenoid sinus. Now, stereotactic image guidance is a wonderful thing, but it's an excuse for poor surgeons to do things they shouldn't most of the time. All right? So what about stereotactic imaging is very poor back here. It's off millimeters. So I've got a perfect landmark right here. I went back and found that landmark and knew I had five millimeters to get into. So here we are right behind that landmark. Here's the opening. 
There's this small amount of lesion that's probably benign. Next slide. And now we're looking all the way through and we're looking into the air cells of the petrous apex as this is getting completely removed, didn't have to expose the carotid, didn't have to expose the dura. So I'll just go right on to the end of these few little like slides. If you're really nice to patients, the most important thing is for residents is you uh, get cookies. And if you're really good, sometimes you get a birdhouse like this. And so this birdhouse is hanging in my backyard. That's the key to this. So what is transmaxillary? It's microscopic manual view. Your assistant surgeon can be binocular as well and have two hands, four hands in the wound. Uh, there's less, there's no intranasal injury most of the time. And it's beautiful for intratemporal fossa access and lateral clavus. Thank you very much.